Hi, everyone. Welcome to class number five on translations. Tonight, we're talking about textual criticism. Out of all the topics that we are going to cover, this, I think, can sometimes seem very, very technical. And it is unfortunately a technical kind of topic. You know, there are people that get their doctorates in textual criticism, and that is all that they work on their entire life. <laughs> so, so, uh, which, uh, you know, while I think that this is fascinating, I feel like that would be incredibly dull. So, uh, you know, that's not, that's not where I intend to go with this, but we're going to spend an hour doing kind of a quick overview of what is textual criticism. Um, as we, as we embark on this, I want to just give our typical introduction and then also explain what textual criticism is not. Um, this, I think, explains why modern versions are so different from older versions. So this is, is really one of those um, kind of linchpin pieces that explains some of the big differences. Um, these are the eight different things that we are constantly looking at in these classes. These are the eight different things that I think affect translation. There's probably more that I just haven't put down, but we are looking now at the sixth one, even though this is the fifth class, the first class covered the first two, context and translation philosophy. Class number five here is textual criticism. So we're gonna look at how textual criticism impacts translation. Again, I want to highlight that the context is always the biggest determiner of what a verse means. And that is a crucial thing for us because I never want to sound like I'm saying, there's not a way to understand the Bible if you don't know Greek and Hebrew or something like that, or that, you know, people who know Greek and Hebrew are superior to people who don't or, you know, anything like that. I, it, the context is what gives us an understanding of the passage. Greek and Hebrew are helpful, but the context is ultimately the biggest determiner of what the passage means. And this is really up to each interpreter, how they understand the context. Here's the plan. I want to talk about what textual criticism is not. So where it says up there, a difference, we're going to discuss how textual criticism is different from higher criticism. And I think that that's important because a lot of people hear the term textual criticism and they immediately think higher criticism. So we need to differentiate between those two things because as Christadelphians, we really do not agree with higher criticism. Okay. So we'll talk about that. And funnily enough, we actually agree with what's called lower criticism. So that's what we'll be talking about tonight, lower criticism versus higher criticism. Then we're going to talk about what is textual criticism? How, how does it look? And uh, how, does it, how do we practice that in some verses? And then we will be discussing what's called a critical text. So this is the text of the Old and New Testaments that is used in today's translations. Okay, so I'll explain what that is, where it comes from. Translation must care about the text. That is our main point for tonight. And, you know, it's kind of a given, I guess, that in translation, you have to start with what you think is the right text before you can translate. So that's what we are looking at tonight. How do translators get to the point of feeling like, okay, this is the right text. Now, when I say that, what I mean is there are so many thousands of manuscripts and these manuscripts have some differences. So how do you figure out which manuscript is the right one? Okay, so we're gonna be going through that. Again, I think it's crucial to recognize that this does not affect the gospel. You're gonna hear me say that every class, but I think that it always is the key piece. This does not affect the gospel. There is absolutely no way that we should come out of this saying, oh, well, there's so many variants. We just can't understand what the Bible says. You know, that, that's, not, that's not the case at all. The gospel is very clear. The variants do not affect uh, what is the truth. And instead, we're going to be looking at, yes, you know, there's going to be some verses that are questionable whether or not they should be there. But Overall, the message is not changed. 
So that leads into the why question, which is why are modern translations missing so many verses? It comes out to, I believe, about 50 something. There's about 50 something verses that modern translations do not have that older translations like the King James do have. So I'll be going over the actual numbers tonight. So why are these modern translations missing these verses? Okay, here's a nice little comic to start off. It says, you're weak, spineless, and wishy-washy. She really took you apart, didn't she, Charlie Brown? Uh-huh, step by step, verse by verse, and line by line. You sound like a victim of higher criticism. Okay, now, what this is talking about is higher criticism is essentially dissecting every single piece of the biblical text with the assumption that the biblical text was human made. This is why we do not agree with higher criticism. And so you will see how this comes out uh, in this section about higher criticism, that it works off the premise that the Bible is a book like any other book. So textual criticism, criticism and higher criticism are not the same thing. And that's a very important thing for us to recognize. We agree with textual criticism, that it's important. We do not agree with higher criticism. Higher criticism attacks the inspiration of the Bible. Here's how Merriam-Webster defines higher criticism. It says, study of biblical writings to determine their literary history and the purpose and meaning of the authors. Now, see, this is why higher criticism, I think it's important to look into it and kind of understand it. Because if you were to just look at the dictionary definition, you'd say, oh yeah, I agree with that. I wanna study biblical writings to understand their literary history and the purpose and meaning of the author. That's important. But in that term literary history, there is a lot that's packed in. So we want to take a look at what does this actually mean? This is from a Catholic commentary called the Anchor Bible. It is taken specifically from the commentary on what this author calls and what this commentary series calls Second Isaiah. You maybe have heard that term before. It refers to the portion of Isaiah uh, after the story about Hezekiah. Remember how Hezekiah gets sick and is healed and all of that? Uh, there's kind of like this split in Isaiah after those stories. So right about chapter 40, um, a lot of scholars refer to Isaiah 40 to 66 as second Isaiah, which might not seem like a big deal, but consider what this commentary goes on to say. It says, in modern scholarship, the theory that Isaiah 40 to 66 were written later than the prophecies of Isaiah of Jerusalem, Isaiah 1 through 39, was proposed by two German scholars, Eichhorn in 1783 and Dudlerein in 1789. The anonymous author was called Deutero Isaiah, which Deutero means second in Greek, so often in English, second Isaiah. The distinction between first Isaiah and second Isaiah is so widely accepted in modern scholarship that the argument against it need not be examined at length. The distinction between first Isaiah and second Isaiah has been made on the basis of vocabulary, style, and thought. Now, if we were to just pick up this commentary and read it and hear that, well, there's different vocabulary, there's different style, there's different thoughts between these two supposed sections of Isaiah, we might say, okay, that's reasonable. So Isaiah, the prophet wrote chapters one through 39 and some unknown person uh, who was also a prophet, some unknown person wrote chapters 40 through 66. We might, you know, feel tempted to go along with that. And, you know, there wouldn't be a huge issue with that. There's, you know, okay, maybe, maybe this book had a double author. The problem is, is look at what this commentary goes on to say. It says the most striking feature of second Isaiah is the two occurrences of the name of Cyrus. So Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45 are prophecies about Cyrus, the king of Persia who came hundreds of years after Isaiah. Ah, do you see why scholars do not like attributing second Isaiah to Isaiah? He says that Isaiah of Jerusalem, first Isaiah, 
could use the name of a king in a language unknown to him who ruled in a kingdom which did not exist in the 8th century BC taxes probability too far. It is not a question of placing limits to the vision of prophecy, but to the limits of intelligibility. Even if the name were by hypothesis meaningful to the prophet, it could not be meaningful to his readers or listeners. Yet Cyrus is introduced without any explanation of his identity or of why he should be an anchor of hope to the Israelites whom the prophet addresses. If the prophecy is to be attributed to Isaiah of Jerusalem, then these passages must be regarded as later expansions. So he basically just logics himself out of believing that Isaiah wrote this second portion because there is this prophecy that he says would have been meaningless to Isaiah and to the people who heard it. Okay, interesting. Here's the problem. Let's read John chapter 12, because in John chapter 12, it says, the apostle writes, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you see what just happened in these verses? This is a quotation of Isaiah 53 which is in that section dubbed second Isaiah. Problem is, is look at what John says about it. The word spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So as far as I'm concerned, you can look at second Isaiah, second Isaiah, and you can say, oh, well, you know, that's great. There's different vocabulary. There's different style. Apparently Isaiah decided to write in a different style because John tells us clearly that Isaiah wrote this section. Now, in addition to that, Paul says the same thing. Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Paul attributes this to Isaiah, and that is a quotation from Isaiah 65, verse 1. The New Testament then tells us clearly this was written by Isaiah. So the issue with higher criticism is that higher criticism goes on to say, you know, forget what the New Testament says, forget about the cohesiveness of the Bible. We are going to look at each book on its own. Okay, we've examined Isaiah, and Isaiah clearly from this examination must have been written by two different people. So there's there's this, this initial premise that the Bible is just like any other book. And that's the issue with it. Here's a similar thing that happens with New Testament higher criticism. When we turn to Jesus's parables, so this is a book by Amy Jill Levine. Um, she's a major specialist in Judaism and Christianity. It's called Short Stories by Jesus. It's about the parables of Jesus. She says, when we turn to Jesus's parables, we do well to hear them as the people who first heard them. I totally agree with that. You know, we want to try and understand how did the Jews understand Jesus, Jesus's parables. Jews in the Galilee and Judea did, and thus to recover as best as we can, the original provocation. So why were Jesus's parables provocative? To do so requires several leaps of faith. Okay, look at what she says is a leap of faith here. First leap concerns what Jesus himself said. For we do not know with certainty if Jesus actually told the parables recorded in the gospels. Second, even if he did tell them, we know with certainty neither the composition of the audience nor their reaction. Third, it is unlikely, were he to have composed these parables, that he only used them on one occasion or told them exactly the same way each time. The big concern here is what she describes as her first leap, which is, we don't know with certainty if Jesus actually told the parables recorded in the Gospels. This is higher criticism. Higher criticism says the Gospels are a book just like any other book written by humans, and therefore, when Luke was writing the parables, if Luke even wrote them, if Luke was writing the parables, then Luke maybe just made some up. Right? That's, that's where higher criticism goes. And so that is a position that we have decided as Christadelphians, we don't agree with. You know, we believe in the inspiration of the Bible. We don't think you can just do this. You know, you can't just walk up and pull a Thomas Jefferson and cut parts of the Bible out that you don't like. like that's not a, that's not a thing that, that, we agree with. So consider where this leads. This is her next, uh, what she goes on to say. 
She says, the concern for the authenticity of the parables relates to the broader issue of what is known as historical Jesus studies. This is a big thing in scholarship called the quest for the historical Jesus. In other words, the Jesus that is described in the Gospels is not the Jesus of history. We do not have access to Jesus directly. He leaves us no writing, no autobiography, no sanctioned biography. To be blunt, he leaves us neither a physical body nor a body of writing. Instead of having an unmediated Jesus, all we have are the memories preserved and filtered through the concerns and confessions of those who proclaimed him Lord or Savior. She says there was no unbiased historian who was following Jesus around, so therefore we can't actually trust what was in the Gospels. Okay, you can obviously see how there are issues with this. You know, the higher criticism is the kind of thing that the next step is, I don't believe anymore. You know, because that if you come to this conclusion, the Bible is just any normal book, there's no more foundation for faith. So here's, just to give you an idea of that historical Jesus study, this is from the Jesus Seminar. This was the first gathering together of scholars to try and find the historical Jesus. This is by Robert Funk, who was the one who gathered them all together and the one who led the seminar. This is what he said at his opening remarks. He says, we are about to embark on a momentous enterprise. We are going to inquire simply, rigorously, after the voice of Jesus, after what he really said. And so what they did is they sat down and they read the Gospels together. Good plan, right? Except they then, after everything that Jesus said in the Gospels, said, now, would Jesus actually have said this? Yeah, I mean, this is silly, right? Like, think about how ridiculously circular this is. So, so they, they said, would Jesus have said this? Hmm, well, if it's, you know, something that we would not have expected him to say, then probably it's historically accurate, right? And, and that's the way that they, they went around trying to decide what the historical Jesus said. Okay, so you can see the approach that he takes here. He says, in this prophet process, we will be asking a question that borders the sacred, that even abuts blasphemy uh -huh, for many in our society. As a consequence, the course we shall follow may prove hazardous. Indeed, we may well provoke hostility, but we will set out in spite of these dangers because we are professionals and because the issue of Jesus is there to be faced much as Mount Everest confronts the team of climbers. Our basic plan is simple. We intend to examine every fragment of the traditions attached to the name of Jesus in order to determine what he really said, not his literal words, perhaps, but the substance and style of his utterances. We are in quest of his voice insofar as it can be distinguished from many other voices also preserved in the tradition. And unfortunately, what this leads to is when you work on this premise of higher criticism, you always see the contradictions which prevents you from seeing how the Bible harmonizes. Because if you're always just looking for contradictions, then you say, oh, well, there's a contradiction. There's a contradiction. You never get the chance to say, wait a minute, this looks like a contradiction. But how's it actually fit? And when you start asking that question, then you see the beauty in scripture. But that doesn't happen. So in this, this book by well-known author, Paula Fredrickson, she ends up saying, well, here's the issue. Acts and Paul's letters contradict each other. And that's just her conclusion. You know, I'm, I'm not sure which of these to trust because Acts says one thing, Paul's writing in Galatians says another thing. So, you know, the early Christians just couldn't agree. And I, as I was reading this, I found myself thinking, no, you know, you just, just start asking how does Acts and how does Galatians fit together? Because they do, you know, you can harmonize these, you can make these fit. This is where higher criticism leads. So we are not interested in that because we believe that the Bible is inspired. Instead, what we are interested in is lower criticism. So here's what lower criticism is. It is criticism concerned with the recovery of original texts, especially of scripture through collation of extant manuscripts. So in other words, the goal is to look at the manuscripts that exist today and try and figure out what did the original biblical manuscripts say. That is lower criticism. Lower criticism 
looks at biblical manuscripts. Its goal is a recognition that the Bible is inspired, and therefore, because it is, we want to find the original. We want to know what was originally written. Here's an interesting chart. Now, I will say that basically, whenever you throw up a chart like this, it's going to be out of date. Um, biblical manuscripts are found uh, fairly, I mean, you know, relatively frequently. So, so uh, these numbers on here, you know, don't, don't quote these numbers. But what I want to show you is that this chart is the distribution of biblical manuscripts throughout the centuries. If you pay attention to the colors, um, the, those aren't hugely important for what we're talking about, but it's just different types of manuscripts. Uh, papyrus, if you look at the chart, papyrus are the oldest. So they're the blue. And then majuscules would be the next oldest, which are the red. You will notice that there are absolutely zero manuscripts from the first century. There are four, according to this chart, from the second century. But those are also debated. Some of those second century manuscripts, some people would place in the fourth century. So what this means is we don't have any of the autographs. The autograph means the original. You know, when John wrote the Gospel of John, he actually literally wrote something down, right? Probably on a piece of papyrus. And, you know, then that was copied, distributed, copied, distributed. And we don't have that. We don't have the one that John touched. Okay, now it's possible that we do have the one that was a copy of what John touched, but you know, we don't know. So the goal of textual criticism, of lower criticism, is to try and figure out out of all these thousands of manuscripts in the New Testament, there's differences. So which manuscript is right? Okay. Now, let's jump into this a little more before it starts to feel a little bit awkward and thinking like, what? There's differences between the manuscripts. Let's talk about what these differences look like because it's not actually as scary as that might sound. You can imagine the church in Rome receiving Paul's letter and then instantly desiring copies or what we call manuscripts. Wealthy Christians may have wanted their own copies or perhaps a church in another city had heard about the letter and wanted a copy. In the pre-Gutenberg era, so before the printing press, all of these copies would have been made by hand. We know that some of the scribes copied one or two letters at a time. We know that other scribes copied one or two words at a time or more. Both methods reflected the desire for accuracy on the part of the scribe. Unfortunately, right, they're humans, so they make mistakes. While most of the people in the first century were illiterate, unable to read or write, there were enough literate people to produce the copies needed. Most were not professional scribes who were trying to create a work of art. Rather, they were trying to make accurate copies of the manuscript. Despite their best efforts, they made mistakes, which you would expect, right? Sometimes they made an unintentional mistake, such as skipping a word or transposing letters. Other times they made intentional changes. Now, that's not that bad. Okay, don't worry. Usually for good reasons, such as correcting misspellings or poor grammar. So if you look at some manuscripts today, you can actually see where a scribe has crossed out what's on there and written in, oops, you know, I meant to write an extra Omicron or something like that. Like I misspelled this word. <laughs> huh. so, so you can see the scribes going through and correcting. We also know that scribes added notes to the margins, perhaps explaining a word or adding background information they were aware of. Now, before this concerns you, before you think, oh no, like, there's so many changes. I think that we should appreciate the fact that scribes went through and made notes, that scribes went through and made corrections. Like I think this emphasizes the focus that these scribes had on accuracy. They went through and they double, triple checked what they had done. We know this happened because we can look directly at these manuscripts and see marginal notes. The differences between the texts are called variants. Sometimes we talk about a manuscript having a certain reading. A variant is any variation among the manuscripts. This includes differences in wording, additions, omissions, or changes, word order, and spelling. 
It doesn't matter if a variant occurs in one manuscript or a thousand, or if a variant occurs in the second century or the 10th, it is still counted as one variant. With that said, there are about 400,000 variants in the approximately 5,600 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. To state it another way, we have so many variants because we have so many manuscripts. Now, yes, there are more variants than there are words in the New Testament. But that is simply because there are so many manuscripts that every time one manuscript differs from other manuscripts, that's a new variant. And the unfortunate part, I, have any of you ever read before like um, uh, a 1611, 1613 version of the King James? You ever looked at that before? They spell stuff totally differently, right? Or if you're looking at like even Wycliffe's version, Wycliffe does not even have standardized spelling. So he will spell one word one way and then the same word a different way later. Interestingly, that is what you get when you look at a lot of these Greek manuscripts. In a lot of cases, there wasn't standardized spelling. So before you worry about all these variants, I will tell you that the majority of variants, the number that's usually put out there is 99% of the variants are things like spelling differences. Okay, so John actually spelled his name a lot of different ways. <laughs> so so when, when it's written down, one time it's written one way, one time it's written another way. And, you know, that's how people worked. It was a different time. You know, no, people didn't care about that kind of thing. So most of the variants are that kind of stuff. They're just spelling differences that nobody actually cares about. They could be a difference in word order, slightly different word order. Word order does not matter in Greek. So in English, it's very important. You know, if I said, um, uh, if I said, I am going out versus out I am going, right? One makes sense. The other one sounds like I am crazy, you know, or I'm Yoda or something like that. Uh, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. In English, we are all about word order, but in Greek, um, it's, it doesn't matter. So a lot of the variants are also word order like that. So that's something to just keep in mind. Okay. So in a lot of cases, the difference is subtle. There's a letter missing or a word. Sometimes there's spelling differences. Okay. But in that 1% of variants that actually are, you know, different with a whole word, how do you determine which is right? Well, let's talk about the steps to textual criticism. First of all, what you need to do is you need to find the variant. Now, the good news is, is that, as I said, there are people who devote their lives to textual criticism, and they've found them. We don't have to. <laughs> so that, that is a good deal, because, as you saw, there's 400,000 in the New Testament, and who really wants to try and find those? So that's, that's the good news. So you can actually pick up what's called critical editions of the Old and New Testament, and they will walk you through all the variants. Okay, if you know if you find that kind of thing interesting, so that's the first step of textual criticism. You got to determine, okay, is there a variant here? That's the first thing. Now then, the next thing you do is you weigh the external evidence. So the external evidence is the manuscript evidence. It's called external because it is external to the text itself. So for instance, right now I'm actually writing a paper on John 8, verse 38, and a variant in John 8, verse 38. The external evidence is what variants are in what manuscripts. So that's what the external evidence is. It is this manuscript supports this variant reading. And the manuscript that supports that variant reading tends to be a highly accurate manuscript. You know, you read through it and the scribe didn't ever correct anything, you know, something like that. Or this manuscript tends to be really old. You know, it's one of our third century manuscripts. So because it's older, it's closer to the source. So that's the external, um, external kind of evidence. A lot of times when people talk about external evidence, 
you've ever heard people talk about manuscripts, they will often reference um, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Great names, right? <laughs> they, they have to do with uh, where these codexes were found. They're both fourth century codexes. Um, Codex Sinaiticus is actually the, the only complete um, ancient version of the New Testament that we have. So it's full, the whole thing, which is kind of cool. Um, it is, it's in the British Museum. They bought it for $500,000. <laughs> so it's considered, you know, one of their most prized possessions. I don't know if anybody's seen it before. I haven't, but I would love to go see it at some point. Um, it, the, I shouldn't get into this right now because I only have 20 minutes left, but this is, it's a fascinating story. If you ever get the chance to find out about how it was found, it actually was found in the garbage at a monastery in the Sinai Peninsula in the 1800s. So it was being thrown away and it was going to be used as kindling and a 18th century explorer, you know, it was like one of those Indiana Jones kind of things. Uh, he, he saw it and said, wait, you know, don't do this. I'm going to buy this from you. And he grabbed it and ran away. So, so it's kind of a crazy sort of story, but uh, you know, big deal. So that's the external manuscripts. Um, those two codexes, codices, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are considered to be some of the, the major players in terms of like accuracy. So they are weighed very heavily by a lot of textual scholars. After that is the internal evidence. The internal evidence is basically like a logic game. Um, I don't feel hugely comfortable with it, uh, but I do feel like it's kind of helpful. Basically what happens with internal evidence is um, you will look at a passage and say, okay, here's the two, three different words that are used in this passage in the variance. Can I explain logically why a scribe would have added this word in? Like, does it clarify the passage to add the word in? You know, there's that, that uh, the passage in John chapter five at the pool of Bethesda where people question whether or not it's supposed to be there, where it says an angel would come down and stir the water, right? So people will say that the internal evidence is against including that passage because that passage was probably added by a scribe to explain things. I kind of feel like you could also argue, yeah, well, it, the passage doesn't make any sense without it. So, so you know, it's, it's uh, internal evidence, I feel like, is, is hugely subjective. And if I can leave you with a main idea here, that is that textual criticism, I think, should really bring us to humility when we consider these kind of things. Like, for instance, you know, we were talking about Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Well, maybe in 50 years, somebody is going to find an earlier better version than those, better manuscript that disagrees with what those say. You know, so it's, it's the kind of thing that is funny because as textual critics, we have to just work with the evidence that we have. And so it's just one of those things that's acknowledged while people are doing their best, but I don't ever think it's a good idea to be dogmatic about these kinds of things. Okay, and so then after looking at the external and the internal evidence, you then try and identify what do you think is the most original reading. So those are the four steps. You identify the variant, which has already been done in, the, in these critical texts. You then look at the external evidence. You then look at the internal evidence, and then you bring the two evidences together to try and identify what you think is the, um, the original reading. So there you go. What are the differences? Are there any overwhelming manuscript evidences? Any mistake or correction? What's most likely original? Let's go ahead and put this into practice. I've labeled this conflation. This is from Mounts's category. So Bill Mounts, he wrote that book that I quoted earlier, Why I Trust the Bible. This is uh, an example of conflation, which is a piece of internal evidence. 
Conflation is bringing two passages together. Here's the ESV. Here's the King James Version. Do you see what's different? It's right at the end. The ESV drops off that sentence. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. It does not include that. The question is why? Well, let's take a look. Here is the word biblical commentary. This one often includes, you know, matters about textual criticism. That's why I'm quoting it here. It says, many... Oh, here's our steps, by the way. So we've already determined the variant. It's going to look at the external evidence, which I've labeled in blue, and the internal evidence, which I've labeled in yellow. So he says, many manuscripts, and he goes and lists these different manuscripts. You don't really need to worry about those. Many manuscripts add another sentence. He quotes it in the Greek and then in the English. This kind does not come out except by fasting and prayer. So that's the extra sentence that the King James has. But this verse is lacking in, and he goes and he lists a number of other manuscripts. There is no apparent reason that it would have been omitted other than that Matthew chooses to make another point. Thus, it has almost certainly been inserted from the parallel passage. So here's the identification or the determination. Here's the manuscript evidence, the external evidence. Here's the internal evidence where he says there's no apparent reason it would have been omitted other than Matthew chooses to make another point. And so therefore, he identifies it was probably just inserted from Mark. Does this matter? Not really. I don't really feel like it does because it's in Mark chapter 9 anyway, where Jesus says the same thing in the parallel passage. So this is why it's called conflation. It, what people think happened was a scribe was writing it down. They were writing down this verse in Matthew, and they said, uh, nothing will be impossible to you. And then the scribe just working off of, you know, starting to daydream or whatever, then wrote, how be it, this kind does not go out but by prayer and fasting because the scribe knew the passage in Mark. And you know how sometimes you accidentally just write stuff when you're not thinking about it? That's what people think happened. Who knows? So you will notice it's there in Mark chapter nine. Okay, here's another example of explanation. So this is that, that uh, passage that I had referenced in John chapter 5. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Here's the King James. Check it out. King James has a whole other verse and a half. These people were waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So there's a whole extra portion here that's in the King James and not in the ESV. So why is that? Well, here's our four steps in textual criticism. This is from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He explains. Here's the determination, 3b to 4. So this is the verse and a half. They're not in the earliest and best witnesses, he says. So that's the external evidence. They're not in the earliest manuscripts. He says more than 20 Greek witnesses, other like manuscripts. This is kind of curious. There are a number of manuscripts that have it, but that like cross it out. So he says, more than 20 Greek witnesses mark them as spurious. They include a number of words or expressions not found elsewhere in John. So that would be the internal evidence. Right? You would say the text itself doesn't match up with the rest of the Gospel of John. Okay, and more external or more internal evidence. There's a great amount of textual diversity among the witnesses that do not include the verses. Okay, so therefore... He goes on to say, this is a gloss. In other words, this was added, is what, he, what this guy determines. Okay, here's another. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the ESV, that's how the Lord's Prayer ends. In the King James, you get, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There's your extra. So this is from the Anchor Bible. Here's your four steps. This says the doxology for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here's the identification. It gives internal evidence first. It exists in various forms in different manuscripts. That so says manuscripts don't really even seem to agree. Number one. It was evidently added by copyists who understood from their own use that such was the customary way to end a prayer. So this is their suggestion as to why that's there. Okay. So interesting. Here's, here's another uh, um, commentary on this. The absence of any ascription in early and important representatives of the Alexandrian, the Western, and the pre-Caesarean types of text as well as early patristic commentaries on the Lord's Prayer. Let me explain what that is. <laughs> it's just saying early manuscripts don't have it. And whenever the church fathers, like the early church fathers, whenever they write the Lord's Prayer out, they don't include it. Kind of an interesting thing to, to know about. So sometimes when you're doing textual criticism, it's interesting to look at, you know, what did early Christians write? Because you'll notice that they tend to favor a certain variant. All right, one last one. This is an example of correction. The correction's really subtle. See if you can find it here. All right, here it is. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet is what the ESV says. As it is written in the prophets. And the reason that this is considered correction is because the quote that comes right after Isaiah the prophet is from Malachi. It's a quote from Malachi, and then it's a quote from Isaiah. It's this quote that's brought together. It's Malachi and Isaiah. And uh, textual critics tend to think that this is the correct reading, Isaiah the prophet, whereas in the prophets was likely a correction. So here's our four steps. Here's the determination. In the prophets is the variant instead of Isaiah the prophet. The external evidence is that the King James reading is very weak. There's not a lot of manuscripts that say that. In addition, here's the internal. It doubtless arose because the quotations that follow are not only from Isaiah, but include one from Malachi as well. So people were probably bothered by this, you know, how, how's it say that? And so somebody probably changed it thinking, ah, you know, that was a mistake. Okay. So if you find that thing kind of interesting, um, basically what happens is every variant is weighed out by textual critics. They work through all of these. Well, all the significant ones, you know, not all 400,000, because as I said, a lot of them are spelling, but the ones that, that would actually make a difference as to what the text says. Um, they work through each of those, and for the New Testament, they actually give them a rating um, as to like how confident they feel about them. So things like uh, the end of the Gospel of Mark. You maybe if you have a new translation, a newer translation, you'll notice that the Gospel of Mark ends at verse eight of chapter sixteen. It doesn't go all the way to the end, and so uh, these textual critics have rated that as an A, meaning they feel very, very confident that the ending of Mark is not, was not in the original. Interesting thought. So they put together what's called a critical text, and that's where they tell you where, what they think about these things. Now, in case you're wondering, every single Bible translation uses a critical text. So the King James used that, but the thing was is that there were only like a handful of manuscripts at the time. So the critical text was very simple because there weren't a lot of variants. So, so that was very easy. Now there's 400,000 of them. So the critical text has become more complicated. So this is the history of the New Testament text of that critical text. So in the 1600s, Erasmus compiled what's called the Textus Receptus. And that is what formed the basis of the King James. The King James was translated out of this Textus Receptus. It translates to received text in Latin. In the 1800s, 
these two guys, Westcott and Hort, came along and said, you know, there's been a lot of manuscripts discovered. So there's a whole lot more variants from the time of the King James. We're going to go ahead and we are going to create a new critical text instead of the Textus Receptus. And that became the, uh, the basis of the revised version, so of the RV. After Westcott and Hort in the mid 1900s, Nestle and Alan came around and they put together a critical text, which is actually very similar to Westcott and Hort's. Um, there's, it's different in like 50 verses or so. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Clearly, I was off. It's different by in 558 verses from Westcott and Hort. <laughs> there, there you go. Okay. So if you're curious about what Bible versions you use what, ah, there. The versions that use the Texas Receptus are Luther's translation in a German, Tyndale's translation, the King James, Young's Literal, and the New King James. They work off of the Textus Receptus for the New Testament. Westcott and Hort used their revised version. And the Nestle Aland, or the United Bible Society, that's the latest critical text. It's used by the ESV, NIV, New American Standard, and New RSV. So you will notice that basically what, what the idea was behind these newer versions was to try and build off of what had come before. Okay, here's the big difference. The text of the Textus Receptus has about 1,000 more words than that of Westcott and Hort, and about 50 more verses. Several of these verses have become so much a part of the biblical tradition and church liturgy that it has been excruciatingly painful for modern translators to wrench them from the text and place them in a marginal note, even when scholars have known that they were not originally in the text. So this would be like the end of the Gospel of Mark. Um, textual critics feel very certain that the Gospel of Mark should actually end at verse 8. And the story of the woman caught in adultery. So if you've ever wondered, you know, why are these like in brackets in my Bible? That's why. The pain comes from knowing that most people expect to see these words in their Bible. And, you know, when they open it up, they say things like, who took verses out of my Bible? Stuff like that. So these are all the verses. So the Nestle Aland, that's the latest critical text. It differs from the King James, the New King James, or the, the Textus Receptus in these verses, about 50 of them. The major ones are the end of the Gospel of Mark and the story of the woman caught in adultery. Um, another interesting one that you might be intrigued by is when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is considered by textual critics to uh, be a possible exclusion from the text. As stated, the differences don't change the gospel. And, you know, I think wanting to read the original is something that we want to do. So hopefully understanding the principles helps us evaluate the variants a little bit, and we can read about the individual decisions. So, you know, if we're interested to know why did these things get chosen, you can look at the word biblical commentary. So you can pick that up on, on uh, the, the book that you're looking at, in the particular book of the Bible that you're looking at. The word biblical commentary usually goes into textual decisions. The expositor's commentary usually goes into it. And then there's also, you can just get the critical texts. So if you want the critical text in Hebrew, it's the Biblical Hebraica Stuttgartensia. <laughs> uh, I don't really recommend that, though, because, unfortunately, I don't know who came up with this. I think this is really silly. The textual variants were all written in Latin. Who came up with that? I don't know. Maybe the Romans. But, uh, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't. This was made like a hundred years ago, so I'm I'm not sure why they decided to do the textual variants in Latin, as if people need a another language to learn. Um, so what I would recommend is instead, you might find these books helpful. If you use Logos Bible software, um, you can purchase these pretty easily. It's the Lexham Textual Notes on the Bible. 
So the Lexham textual notes on the Bible, you can actually sync it with your Bible in Logos. And uh, you can look at every, the textual differences for every verse. It goes through and it explains to you, you know, every, every choice that was made. If you want more information than that, Bruce Metzger is considered like the major player in textual criticism. He wrote a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament, where he goes into every single variant in detail. So that's the Lexham textual notes on the Bible and a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament. Philip Comfort also wrote um, a textual commentary, if you're interested in that. So here's the conclusion. As manuscripts have been discovered, variants have been revealed. Textual criticism has the goal of finding the original reading because translation must care about the text. But again, what I think we need to recognize in all of this is we have the gospel. This does not affect the gospel. And instead, what this should do is this should cause us to pause and recognize that when we are getting angry because we're disagreeing with someone about a verse, or when we're becoming extremely dogmatic about a verse, we need to step back and realize, you know, it's almost like in certain cases, God built in ambiguity into the Bible. And I think he did it on purpose because I think God wants to humble us, show us there's still things that we don't know. And that even if we keep searching and keep searching, those are going to be kingdom questions. So we do the best we can. We use logic and we try and come up with the best ideas. But I think ultimately we have to recognize that even with these modern versions, which think this is the original text, it's just our best guess for those variants, just to make that clear. Not with the gospel. All right, there you go. So any questions about this? I recognize that this could be kind of a head exploding kind of um, topic. <laughs> what about Stephen's comment uh, in Acts where he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. The same sort of words as the Lord Jesus. Is that considered questionable too? It is not. So this is where I feel like that is an awesome example of the way that even though a verse might change, the concepts don't. So you can say, you know, this idea of forgiveness in the midst of a trial and such, that that is still biblical, even though that verse might not necessarily be there. <laughs>